Good afternoon. I'm Kira Bailey, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience and co-director of the COVID-19 course along with Dr. Francesca Nestor in Politics and Government. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 16th lecture in our series. Today we will learn from Dr. Saif Rahman. Dr. Rahman is the Robert Bauman Associate Professor of Economics in the Economics and Business Department at Ohio Wesleyan. His primary interests lie in the areas of economic development, poverty alleviation, international trade, and institutional reform. His past research has included the use of game theory and empirical analyses to examine the viability of policy reforms, the political economy of international negotiations, international assistance from multilateral institutions such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and various other aspects of globalization and development. In recent years, he has focused on solution design research to design and implement small-scale educational reform in rural Bangladesh. The associated fieldwork takes him to an impoverished part of Bangladesh each year, where he works directly with elementary school children and the public school system in altering the rate and scope of student learning. Dr. Rahman came to Ohio Wesleyan from Agnes Scott College, where he was the recipient of the Student Senate Annual Faculty Award for Teaching Excellence. At Ohio Wesleyan, he presently teaches Principles of Economics, Intermediate Microeconomics, Economic Development, International Economics, and Global Poverty, along with occasional honors courses. As a reminder, you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. I'll select some questions for Dr. Rahman to answer if time permits. You can also continue your discussions on the COVID-19 course Facebook group. And now, international and global economic aspects of COVID-19. Where are we and where do we go? Thank you so much, Kara. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this course. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of this amazing lineup. Uh, that we've had through the summer and still have a couple of more weeks. And hello to everyone uh, who's here and especially anyone that uh, I know from before, especially if I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, it's sort of interesting to do all of this without being able to see others. It's a strange world, a Zoom world that we live in. Um, all my life, I felt that the world and all the surroundings around us is interesting. I've always found life and uh, the world to be very interesting, but I don't think I ever imagined uh, living to live through and or witness the kind of history that we are seeing now. Um, so I, I really want to do what I can today with today's uh, discussion to help us think about the some of the socioeconomic aspects of the COVID-19 crisis, bringing in particularly the global aspects, international aspects um, from an economics angle, but this is not about economics at all. Uh, this is about people. Um, that's how I always learned and lived economics, that ultimately economics is about people and their well-being. And I would like to be able to do what I can to help us think about how COVID-19 coupled with the economic impact that it's having uh, in somewhat very unusual way is affecting people's lives. And I think what's very um, important and useful is for us to think beyond our local surroundings or boundaries and look outward and take stock of how things are, because sometimes, you know, there are very, you know, a lot of similarities, but also sometimes there are differences. And I think seeing those differences can give us a lot of perspective um, and perspective usually strengthens us as individuals and as citizens of a society. And so I'm really honored to be able to share um, this, the international and global aspect of uh, our, this phenomena that we are experiencing. So what I want to do is, let's see. 
what I would like to do is to touch on four aspects uh, that I think are quite relevant to our human experience at this point with this pandemic and the economic damages that it's uh, causing. And given that these four aspects really cannot be uh, separated, they're really interlinked, uh, I will, by construction, be touching on various aspects of the four questions as we move along. So bear with me, uh, I will uh, share with you a lot of um, graphs or charts, but I'll try to explain what the graphs are telling us. And some of the graphs we may sort of, you know, skip over or uh, move through quickly, but some of the other ones I think could tell us a lot about um, what the differences are and what kind of effects we are seeing uh, you know, causal effects or cor you know, correlations and such. So let me uh, mention the four overall questions that I thought would be useful for us to think about. The first is something that hopefully you have um, a general idea about by now because we are in our eighth week and you've had uh, several discussions already if you've been part of this uh, on somewhat regular basis. Um, the economic effect of the pandemic. And the overall the economic effect is proving to be quite different than the kind of crisis we have seen in the last uh, almost 100 years, starting from the 1920s. Now, the Great Depression comes close, but the Great Depression did not have to tackle what we are facing now. So there is the question of what is the impact? Why is it so different? Uh, and what do we know about the potential path to recovery? The second aspect that I would like to touch on is how uh, vulnerable populations in our societies, in our societies within a country and in our societies uh, around the globe, how they're being affected. And why is it that the impact may be different uh, depending on where they are um, and what kind of um, government or leadership or infrastructure they have. So outlining those, I think, will help us to uh, use a, a lens, you know, something that I'm hoping to be able to share, use that lens to be able to begin to see the differential experiences that we uh, are witnessing across countries. The third is to go a little bit deeper potentially and see if we can identify the differential effects um, in terms of geographical location or in terms of income levels uh, or racial uh, minorities or ethnic minorities or gender minorities. By When I say gender minorities, not total population wise, but in terms of our socioeconomic structure, and that would be women in particular. Uh, and there's been a reasonable amount of documented evidence and news reporting indicating that racial uh, minorities, ethnic minorities, and women are carrying disproportionate amount of the burden of not just the COVID-19 uh, health crisis, but the corresponding economic crisis. Um, so hopefully, the, some of the things that we'll look at will be able to uh, give us a foundation to think more about those even beyond today's discussion. And the final one, really uh, comes from the first three questions. Uh, and it's the question of where do we go from here? You know, if we understand where we are and what the problems are, um, some of the nuances, then I think that gives us some, at least some ideas about where we might be going. Now, do I know where we are going? Uh, obviously not, but um, some of the possibilities are becoming less likely as we move through time. Uh, and a couple of my graphs or charts that you will see uh, will show you how our understanding of the impact of this crisis itself is changing from April to May, May to June. The, the numbers are changing. Um, some things are getting worse, unfortunately. So let me go through uh, the information that I put together. Now, I think it's useful to step back and think about why this combination that we have, the health 
crisis and the economic crisis, why this is uh, fundamentally different than, let's say, the Great Recession from about um, 11 years ago, or previous um, episodes of economic stress, or previous episodes of um, outbreaks, disease outbreaks. Uh, and so the four reasons, you know, I, I think of as the four S's, uh, one is the source of the problem that we are facing, especially when you view it from an economic angle. Uh, the source of the problem is not within our direct control. The source of the problem is a health um, source. It's a virus and the virus is mutating. Um, and, and the reason why the discussion about vaccine and, the, and the, the timeline for the vaccine becomes important, that's something that'll come up, uh, I believe, next week. Uh, that's important because mutations are taking place. So far, we are sort of fortunate in terms of the extent of the mutations and how close they are to the COVID-19 as we know it. Uh, but these are things that are not uh, the kind of thing we can control easily. So we need the health system response and the research to really solve uh, a the sort of the foundational problem here. The second uh, reason why our overall economic dilemmas and economic uh, challenges are relatively unprecedented is the scale of the problem. And I'll show you a couple of graphs to, to um, share how we really have not seen, not even in the Great Depression, we have not seen this scale of an economic problem. The third uh, is the, what I call the second responders. So the first responders, I think we all understand the frontline um, individuals and groups. But second responders, what I'm thinking of is, our, you know, it, it's us, people, the ordinary people making up uh, society. And we need to respond. We need to be responsible in terms of uh, following the guidelines that are well coordinated and scientifically based, fact based. And if we don't do that, then that creates a problem in terms of limiting the damages. And, and societies or communities where they are able to uh, step forward and respond um, according to the guidelines and according to the uh, either restrictions or regulations, they are showing more success. And so um, when it becomes difficult for us to convince our own society or communities to follow the guidelines, that really makes it difficult to solve both of the problems, the health crisis and the economic crisis. And purely from an economic standpoint, uh, we are facing a dual problem, uh, one from the supply side and one from the demand side. And whenever you know you go to the grocery store or whenever you go to a haircut place, you know whenever we go out and get something from somebody else and we make a payment and we've gotten used to that instead of uh, trying to be self-sufficient um, subsistence uh, living whenever we do that you know there's that buying side the demand which requires affordability income and also willingness to go out there and uh, carry out the transaction or have online transaction uh, but it also has to have the supply you know, the, the products I mean, the goods and the services would have to be there. And what we are witnessing is a dual shock where early on from the United States standpoint, it was mainly a supply shock we were looking at. We were looking at a scenario where there was this outbreak in China and then it was sort of beginning to spread uh, by February. And we thought, okay, our supply chain where we have linked ourselves to many other countries, including China, you know, that's getting disrupted. So we will face this supply shock, you know, things will be harder to make and get, and therefore prices probably will go up and we'll have a sort of a contraction of the overall level of activity. Buying, selling will become a little bit more limited. But then when the health crisis came to our country, and the same is true for any other country, uh, the, when the health crisis came to our country, because of the infection and the, uh, the, um, the uh, transmission rate, uh, this became eventually a demand side problem also. And so when you have a supply shock that's limiting what can be done between two entities, and you also have a demand shock that limits what can be done from the buying side, you have a double whammy. And, 
and, and the, the problem becomes much deeper. And there are some details in terms of why the supply side is uh, feeling a very deep shock because the supply shock is not simply about the supply chain, it's also about the inability of farms, businesses, and farms to keep doing what they normally do. Credit is an issue, getting the proper loans can be an issue, uh, having to let go of employees and you know, workers, and then there, there are job skills that may diminish because of the layoffs, because of the separation from work, uh, you know, for some duration. Those kinds of things will deepen the supply problem. And on the demand side, there's fear uh, in terms of getting out there and doing the normal thing, business as usual. There is a loss of income uh, that many people are experiencing. So that prevents them from going out there and taking care of uh, purchases. Um, cash flow becomes a problem both for the businesses, the farms, as well as for households. Bankruptcies are uh, increasing in frequency. And so when you have all these purely from that economic side, that becomes a major problem that we don't usually see. We usually see a supply shock problem sort of taking an economy down for a while, or sometimes we see a demand side problem taking an economy down for a while. We don't often see supply and demand both coming at the same time and contracting the economy. So that's the fourth aspect that makes it um, particularly different this time around. So these are four reasons why what we are facing now uh, is much deeper and it's harder to solve. So in terms of the source of the problem being different, uh, this is something that we humankind, we have seen uh, uh, about a hundred years ago, you know, a pandemic, you know, what we call the Spanish flu uh, pandemic. And uh, the pictures are one from 1918 and the other one from uh, 2020. Uh, but the graph that's on the top right corner is simply showing the surge, the infection surge that happened uh, about 100 years ago with that pandemic. And what I have here is sort of the updated um, count of daily deaths. These are confirmed daily deaths confirmed in association with COVID-19. And the scale of the problem in terms of our current expectations of modernization and technology and medicine and research, uh, this is very disturbing in terms of the, the persistence of the problem. And those who have the health science background are in a better position to talk about the details of uh, the, the momentum, the reproduction rate or the reproductive rate and how it persists and potential second waves that may be coming. What you have here, um, is the economy in recession. And this is showing the percentage of countries in the world that are going into a recession. This is completely unprecedented. So if you go back to the 1930s and look at the Great Depression, uh, which is when the United States had 25% unemployment rate and it was a prolonged, very deep, uh, quite difficult time for a lot of uh, families. Even there, we did not have a situation where almost all countries we are facing this downturn. Now we have that. And so we don't have a, an external source uh, that, would be a, in, that would be a buyer for our products, or we don't have the supply chains intact with some other external entities that would allow us to keep things moving. So we are all in this together as a globe in facing this economic potential collapse. Now, when it comes to the third aspect why it's so different, you know, the issue of the secondary or second responders, you know, that's where mitigation comes in. We are asking people to uh, maintain social distance and we are asking them to follow the guidelines in terms of partial lockdowns or lockdowns or not having certain types of activities or gatherings. And what you see here is a graph where the black bars, the vertical black bars are giving you uh, on a weekly basis, actually it gives you the seven day moving average uh, over these past few months, the new cases of uh, COVID. And the red line 
is giving you an index number uh, that gives you how much mitigation uh, is being applied. So basically the guidelines that our local state or national governments are uh, coming up with and what kind of rules are in place. So you'll see this is globally, by the way, this is not for one country. And so when you look at the global average, you see that there is a similarity in terms of how the mitigation efforts uh, have been in place versus the infection um, rates or infection uh, that has been happening. Now I'll show a similar graph, uh, but it will focus on the Euro uh, currency zone, the Eurozone, that's the, the, those countries that use the Euro. So basically the, it's like the European Union, you know, if you think of the EU, it's you know, that area. And so if you focus on that area, you'll find that there are some countries that didn't quite match up with this, you know, what the World Bank would call stringency. The stringency is capturing the stringent mitigation efforts that are uh, being put in place. And so you begin to see the differentiation among countries in terms of what infections they are experiencing and what um, mitigation efforts they are putting in place. So I think that's useful. The takeaway from that is that, look, um, not every place is going to have the same experience. Part of it will depend on, and hopefully by now we understand that reasonably well, part of it will depend on how uh, the policy guidelines are being set, the timing of the uh, guidelines, and then whether people follow them. Now, in terms of recovery paths, and I won't spend too much time on the details of the recovery paths, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my colleague Bob Gitter uh, talked about the US economy in particular, and he talked about different paths of recovery. So this, uh, you know, there are a few different ones, uh, but this is, and this is part of also the reading that uh, I had selected for anyone who was interested in, in reading these. Uh, so this is yeah, from one of those readings. So this actually shows the actual, the, the real life recovery for Canada uh, when we had the Great Recession. So you see the dip that happens uh, right in the gray area, the gray captures, that's how we usually in our charts we capture the recession period. So they drop down. And the reason why we call it the V is that they picked up enough strongly enough whereby they caught up with the original, the pre-crisis, um, the GDP or economic activity level. So that's the V shape recovery. The U shape recovery, which was the reality for the United States with that great recession experience, what happened is that the United States uh, picked up the growth momentum that it had before the crisis, but it didn't have an extra umph in the growth momentum for them to catch up to the previous trend line. And we never did. So it was like a one-time shift downward uh, that happened. And so for a, quite a while, we basically stayed under the original projection. We lost something and we were never able to accelerate to compensate for that. So this is what uh, they call the U uh, curve or the U shape recovery. And then the L shape one, the one that Greece actually experienced uh, from that same great recession was much more prolonged and the damage that had happened was not done happening. For Greece, for example, the damage continued to happen. And so they got weaker and weaker in terms of their ability to uh, get the economy going. And so that's when you have the L shape. Um, it seems unlikely that the United States will be able to get anywhere close to a V shape recovery. There are those who would like to convince, um, I guess, you know, people, anyone listening, that we are in for a great uh, recovery and it'll be quick. Uh, but the economics and the data, the evidence, everything indicates that the V is now pretty much, the V is very difficult to achieve. I, I should not say impossible. Uh, and it and it has to do with how we handled the the situation early on. There are ways to prevent the deep uh, problems. Now, if you look at the unemployment scenario, uh, what you would find is that relative to some of the other um, comparable countries, relatively rich, industrialized, advanced economies, countries in Europe, 
uh, our unemployment claim, you know, that's an indicator of how much the extent to which people are uh, being laid off and therefore they are relying on unemployment compensation, unemployment insurance claims. And that has shot up in, in a way that's completely unprecedented. And so that creates the kind of backlog, it creates the kind of uh, overwhelming scenario whereby our system is not designed to handle that. And so you see a lot of problems and the system is trying to work through all of that. This is not super important for the ultimate purpose, but I just wanted everyone to understand that in terms of what the government can do, there are a few different things. One of them is for the central bank to make sure that cash flow does not become the, the freezing point of the economy. And so what the central bank, that's our Federal Reserve and other countries have their own central banks in their names. What they try to do is they try to make it easier for entities, especially businesses, but also uh, others if needed, to make it easier for them to get borrowed cash. Um, and what you see is that with the COVID-19 crisis uh, onset, basically much throughout the world, there has been this liquidity support coming from all the central banks all around the world. So this is not something specific to one country. This is something that uh, is understood as something that's needed. And oftentimes, as it has been the case over the past few months, some of those um, expansion of liquidity or cash flow from the central bank is coordinated with other countries' central banks. And that's part of international economics in terms of making sure that you're not trying to do something that creates a ripple effect and hurts a, a, a friendly country. And so those things happen. Unfortunately, providing the cash flow just makes sure that the, the, the that money mechanism does not freeze, but it does not get people to go out and just spend money. If they're afraid, then that still has a chokehold on uh, the economy. Uh, I know the word chokehold has particular meaning these days, and I actually knowingly am using that. Um, <clears throat> this is a technical concept we call elasticity, you know, sort of fancy things that we borrowed from physics more than 100 years ago. And what it basically tells us is that when your economy is down, you're going to see your uh, trade and trade partnerships with other entities or other nations go down disproportionately. When we go back up, we again recover some of those links, but they're not symmetric, meaning we don't recover the same way as we let go of the trade links. So when a lot of the countries, uh, almost all countries are suffering this recession, everyone is walking away disproportionately from the trade links even when they are reliant on a lot of imported things and reliant on foreign buyers to sell their own things. And so what you see here is an international component that further deepens, deepens the economic problem that we have because when we are down, our link, our positive links with other countries goes down even further. And that comes back to bite us again because it sort of stops the wheel from turning the way it used to. Stock market, I would like, uh, I would propose to everyone that stock market is not a great reflection of the real economy and the real people's uh, real jobs and lives and certainly not a reflection of socioeconomic conditions. And so I really don't want to spend time talking about the stock market or stock valuations. But if someone is wondering, you know, how the stock market projections might be, uh, the graph shows how we experienced from the peak, how we experienced the stock market uh, downturn and then upturn from the 2000 recession and then from the 2008, 2009 Great Recession. And so we are in the early stages of the current recession. So it just sort of gives you some perspective. Where are we going in terms of our economy's um, potential? This is from April. And this was based on a polling of economists from you know, around a lot of economists. And the forecast back in April was that countries like United States, Canada, countries in Europe, some of the Latin American countries, Australia, they're in for a deep hole for the rest of 2020. 
whereas some of the uh, Asian countries, including particularly in East Asia, it would not be, it would be bad relative to what they were going to experience otherwise, but they would not be in the same kind of deep hole. They might even have some positive growth, but it would be much less than what they otherwise uh, were poised to experience. So that was back in April. This too is back in April. This is from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And what you see here is that they filled in more of the uh, data and analysis to cover Sub-Saharan Africa. And you see the green spots. The green spots are telling us that there's still going to be some positive growth. So the economy is still moving further up from uh, where they are. And that's overall, relatively speaking, good news. The bad news is that, look at all the red, uh, North America, much of South America, Europe, Australia, now Russia is red, whereas back in April uh, with the economists um, polling, Russia did not look as bad or did not feel as bad. But IMF thought that Russia would be uh, in trouble in terms of maintaining the economic momentum. This is also from IMF and this gives you more of a longer term perspective and what's particularly useful to see is the dip that we are expecting for 2020 in terms of the economic vibrancy and then the recovery. And what you see is these are growth rates. These are not GDP levels. These are not, let's say the number of jobs or the number of TVs that we make, uh, though we don't really make TVs anymore, uh, but the number of robots we make. These are not the number of things we make. This is the rate at which we are raising our capacity. And that will, you know, that will recover to our previous rate. But if we recover part of what we lost, then we will not even get back to the original GDP and we would be further below. At best, we might be looking at a U-shape recovery. Uh, and it might be a little bit deeper U-shape as opposed to a short, nice U-shape. This is um, giving us a similar uh, diagram, but this one is from, uh, this, this is from nine days ago, June 8th. This is from the World Bank. And that has now a lot more information. And they are pointing out the distinction between what we think of as advanced countries or economies, the United States and Europe and Australia, Japan, uh, you know, 20 plus countries. And then EM, emerging markets and developing economies. So that's a group, um, 100 plus countries. And what you see is that the emerging market and the developing uh, country economies, they are going to experience a little bit better outcomes, whereas the advanced economies are going to experience a little bit worse outcomes. So there, there's going to be these, the, the, these differences in terms of the economic prospects, both for 2020 and coming out into 2021, if things go okay. This is, by the way, a baseline projection. Right now, there is, I, th I would say there is more likelihood that we are not going to stay with the baseline. We are going to go into the worse more of the what's called the you know sort of the down risk uh, scenario, which is going which which would look worse than this. Um, this I think is an interesting. So if you go back to where we were before spring break, you know sort of early part of March, and we are getting ready for that last week, and then we are going to spring break, and then we find out about the the, the crisis hitting United States and Ohio uh, has been considered one of the leaders in terms of how we moved fast and um, it, it helped. So we were basically experiencing an aspect of the red curve. That's the advanced economies as a group. The United States is part of that. And I don't know if you remember, but um, Dr. Franklin from Politics Government, he talked about how some of the low income countries are showing sort of less infection. Uh, they don't, they're not really seeing the problems. And it sort of creates a question of why aren't they, why are they uh, showing that immunity? Is it, is it something in that, you know, in their race or G DNA, or is it something about their uh, political regime, or is it something about the setup? And if you now look back, based on what we now know, you know, April, May included, what you see is that while we went through our first peak, at least, or maybe the only peak, while we are now on the downside, those countries, uh, these are a lot of countries all together, and Brazil and India are very two, two very prominent ones there. They are 
moving up. Right now, India has the highest um, daily rate of infection. Uh, Brazil, I believe, has the second highest. In terms of overall uh, accumulated problem, United States is the world leader. We always like to say we are number one, so we are number one there. Uh, Brazil is now number two in terms of the deaths and the problems. So there is this, when you think of it globally, both the COVID problem and the economic problem, a major problem is building up and it's south of us um, in, in South America, Latin America, and it's in South Asia and it's in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's going to be a major headwind. It's going to be a major problem. They, those countries cannot take care of those problems on their own. Uh, and this chart gives you a peek at why. This is quantifying the healthcare capacity in terms of workers available, healthcare workers available, the frontline uh, workers, and also hospital capacity, hospital beds. And there's a clear difference between the advanced economies that we experience around us and all these countries, 100 plus countries, uh, that are the emerging markets and developing economies. And so if we struggle with our high capacity, now imagine them dealing with about half of that capacity and low income. Um, you can begin to imagine in a bad case scenario what might happen uh, in, in Latin America and in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I wanted to put in this graph just to let you know that there is a possibility, a decent possibility that the way our stringency, which are the mitigation efforts and the infection rates or the R or the confirmed cases that we are finding out, the correlation may not be as great as we might hope for it to be. I had earlier shown you a couple of graphs with mitigation and uh, stringency. This one I wanted to bring up because if you look at the graph, if you look at the labels, there, is a, there seems to be a clear distinction between countries that tend to export commodities like you know, copper and diamond and oil and those kinds of things versus countries that tend to import those kinds of things. Countries that tend to rely on commodity exports, they seem to have much higher degree of confirmed cases, which is very interesting. But from the viewpoint of economic development and global poverty, uh, which I'm sort of familiar with, those are my fields. That's actually not a surprise because when, when countries focus, uh, Venezuela would be an example, when countries focus on some commodities as their primary driver of their economy, you know, exporting those things, and they're very much reliant on that, they end up getting complacent about those revenue streams and they don't build up other diversified and more modern and future forward-looking aspects of the economy. So then when something goes badly, like for other reasons, Venezuela has been having major problems, economic and political, then they can't handle it. And I think that may be connected, that same logic may be uh, applicable here. A couple of, um, a few final uh, things here. I wanted to bring in that question of vulnerable populations, but apply it globally. So I know that within the United States, uh, there's CDC documentation. There's also a publication from The Lancet, the medical journal, uh, that point to disproportionate burdens borne by racial minorities, ethnic minorities. Um, in Australia, there is a major, potential major crisis looming in terms of the socioeconomics and demographics. Women were uh, very much involved in the front line in childcare and they uh, supported that early on. And then when everything went reasonably well and now they're looking for that reopening, they they're basically dumping them uh, and dumping the childcare industry. And they are putting you know, all, all of, much of their resources on construction and those kinds of things for the reopening. And what that's doing is it's creating a major uh, social effect on women and on those uh, sectors like education and schooling, which is similar. Uh, we have had about 1 million layoffs in, in our K through 12 system. Um, and that creates a long-term structural damage because you're basically pulling the rug out of a, a, a system, the education system, which is one of probably the two most important thing for a society 
for thriving health and education. So what this shows you is that if you look at the countries that tend to be weak and vulnerable, not because they're lazy, but because they've struggled historically or they were colonized or there, there are various reasons. This COVID-19, if you separate out the various effects that can cause or help with poverty alleviation or cause people to become poorer, when you sort out all those things and you isolate the COVID-19 effect, the baseline effect is that we might be looking at about 100 million people newly falling into extreme poverty. Extreme poverty is the equivalent of us in America having about a couple of dollars to spend for the entire day. And that's how our days on average would go for the entire year and for the next year and so on. That's extreme poverty. Uh, they, they, they don't really have usually three meals a day that, that, that feel and taste good. Um, if baseline projection does not hold, if we go into the down risk scenario, then we are looking at potentially 140, 150 million additional people uh, falling into extreme poverty. Famine is something we were already de uh, projecting in the neighborhood of, let's say, 100, 150 million people uh, going you know, into starvation. And now that's almost doubled because of COVID-19 and the economic damage that we are not being able to control. So those who are poor, especially extreme poor in various parts of the world, uh, the suffering is going to be huge. This is a geographical distribution of where those sufferings will be uh, newly added. And Sub-Saharan Africa was going to be the biggest hotspot in terms of deepened extreme poverty. But with what's happening with the um, the this reopening of the Indian society and economy, India is now going through a major surge. And so because of the India effect, now South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh included, South Asia is now going to, is projected to be the biggest uh, place where it would be the hardest hit in terms of extreme poverty. These are all new additions to extreme poverty that otherwise would not have happened if we had not faced this um, dual crisis, the COVID-19 and the economic damage. Uh, there, there are more parts to that chart, but the main idea was to recognize that uh, we have information about where these um, difficulties and challenges will appear, or at least some decent projections. This is a, a graph I just wanted you to know. Um, this is something that we do to capture the different aspects of a poor family. And if they face deprivation from multiple angles, then there's a quantification of that. We basically conceptualize that as multidimensional poverty. It is in those cases that when you just, let's say, build a water well for them, or you give them $25, or you just paint the school building for them, that will not lift them out of poverty. It's too little. And where you have multidimensional poverty, there's a lot more thinking and coordinating and resource infusion that would be needed, really help them in a lasting way. And the same is true for African Americans or Native Americans or whoever else who struggle systematically or systemically within the United States. If they face a multi-pronged um, struggle where they're marginalized in multiple ways, then doing one dimensional reform is not going to really have a lasting effect. And so it has a lot of lessons for what we are facing uh, in the present day for the United States, but it also gives you a sense as to why Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, and then South Asia, both of those are really purple and deep purple, uh, why, why the COVID-19 combined with the economic damage can become really problematic in these two parts. And the population count-wise, that's, that's a huge, uh, portion of the world population. Um, so let me wrap up here. You know, I think we all overall hopefully understand that in order to have a successful strategy in managing uh, such a crisis, you have to have support and you have to have a few other things. The support can come from the community. It can come from public sector, meaning government um, arranged safety nets, or it could come from NRC systems. In a lot of countries right now, they do not have two of the three at least. 
And when that's the case, it makes it very unlikely and very difficult for them to be able to manage. And things are happening, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with uh, people in multiple countries and the news is not good. It's, it's uh, worsening and, you know, people are dying. Um, they're doing the best they can. It's different from when we think of uh, ending social distancing or ending the lockdown so that we can go out to a restaurant or a bar or go and, you know, do various things. We are talking about another reality at the same time in other parts of the world where it's a matter of life and death. It's not about going to a restaurant. Um, so there's a Peru article that you know I, I was hoping that uh, we would get a chance to read. You know, not not during the discussion, but sort of in the background. And if you did take a look at that, you would find that they had a great plan. But what happened is that their underlying a system had a lot of structural inequality among people, poor people, uh, and the infrastructure was not there for well set up uh, for all of the population. People had jobs during the growth period, but these jobs were not the ones that would stick even during tough times. So then they're facing major problems. In Mumbai, they had a little bit of a different experience. Uh, they did a little bit of testing or they're doing, they're trying, but they really can't afford to have the social distancing and they don't have the support uh, and they don't have the medical equipment. So for that reason, it's a major problem. And that's sort of the story in throughout much of India. Kerala, this is very interesting. Kerala is on the west side of India in other province. And Kerala is being led in terms of this crisis by um, the health minister, Shailaja. Uh, they, call him, they call her Shailaja teacher. Uh, she was a secondary school teacher. And with her leadership, they did everything, check mark, and they have 35 million population. They have a total death amount of 20. If you look at the chart, you will see that when India recently, a few weeks ago, ended their lockdown and began to reopen, they began to get a lot of the Indian migrants coming back to India from the Middle East. Kerala has a lot of uh, people who go and they migrate, so they came back. But when they came back, they brought COVID with them. But because of the leadership and the infrastructure and the public-private partnership that Kerala has built up over time, even though the cases are skyrocketing, the deaths do not. It's an amazing story. And it's an amazing ratio. And it's right there in India, whereas other parts of India are not able to replicate that. And it gives us the sense of how you manage the economy and the social, you know, the social uh, and socioeconomic infrastructure in order to handle such a crisis. So I definitely think that it's possible or it was possible or it can be possible to take such a crisis that we are facing and manage that. But beyond the infrastructure and the mitigation and the support uh, and communication and the supplies, you also need that public-private partnership and you definitely need leadership. I think the Kerala example provides a fine uh, story of how leadership makes a big difference. So the two questions that I think would be useful for us to wonder going you know, far into the future. One is why is it that the minority populations around the world and particularly in the United States too, why is it that they carry this disproportionate burden? And if we can figure out why, then what can society practically do to prevent these kinds of outcomes in the future or in the far future? And the other question, uh, is the question of what will happen to this world of you know 200 or so countries as we navigate through COVID-19 and then hopefully we come out on the other end um, reasonably well. You know, will we be as nationalistic and as conflicting uh, as we seem to be today, or will we come out with more openness, with more cooperation, and with a realization uh, more across the board that ultimately we are all humans and there is something called humanity and that maybe humanity and goodness is worth fighting for and maybe that's valuable enough whereby we would like to work with other humans. Um, so on that note, again, thank you and sorry for the extra time that I <laughs> took, um, but I'll be glad to entertain uh, any questions or just have you uh, participate in your own discussions. 
Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I appreciate how much you connected what you were talking about with some of our previous lectures and things from other disciplines. It really shows how interconnected all of these parts are and how we need to be thinking about this um, from multiple angles. So we have uh, several good audience questions here. Um, the first one is um, about what kinds of large scale economic policies we as voters might be able to advocate for, at least in the short term, to try to minimize some of the human suffering that's been a result of COVID-19. And a, a kind of related question to that um, from someone else is, if you had the ear of politicians, what would you recommend they should be doing now in regards to the economy? Um, those are very heavy questions. Uh, I think those are questions that point to the kind of crossroads many of us feel we are uh, at. On the second question, if, we, if, if I had anyone's ear, um, I would really encourage them to ask people, our people, what's important to them. I think this goes beyond any particular economic aspect. I think at the bottom of it, we need to ask ourselves, does goodness matter? You know, our value system, which is why I, I really appreciate all these other disciplines that you know I did not major in, uh, humanities, arts, music, uh, history, sociology, anthropology, psychology. Uh, there's there's so much that uh, there's so much to learn. Now, short of learning all that much, I think. If we as a people um, could just take a step back and ask ourselves what, where is our moral compass as individuals? Not a leader, not a politician, but where's our moral compass? I think that would go a long way. We have become so tribal that it becomes very difficult to engage in a conversation about how do we help society? It's more about how do we help my people or my group or my tribe. Um, in terms of the economic policies or economic directions, I think in a, at a time like this, it's extremely important for the policymakers and the politicians and voters to recognize that there are a lot of families who are not well invested in stock market, therefore stock market valuation does not do much of anything for them. And we are talking about the vast majority of American people. We need to think about why with the combination of the health uh, trajectory, the disease trajectory and their need for income, uh, why it's a very difficult task. Um, from those developing countries you see from Peru, you see from Mumbai, they're basically saying it's either starve or you know, you, you either don't work uh, so that you're safe from the disease, but then you starve to death, or you go out there and then you get the disease. Um, I don't think the United States in, is, is in that position. I, I don't think they're the same. I think we can afford to go along with the, the health experts guidelines and the scientists guidelines. I like science and scientists. Um, I think we can go along with that, but like the Corella model, uh, if a poor, relatively poor country's province can provide the support to support the social distancing and the lockdowns, then why could we not do that as one of the richest, most powerful countries? So I think you know, when it comes to the stimulus and sending the checks to individual households, I think more of that would be very useful um, and creating a way where you look at the health science of it as you reopen, as opposed to making it political. Because I think we have politicized the reopening, we have politicized the mask wearing, uh, and that's just not the right way of going about it. No matter what the Fed does or what the stimulus package is, if we cannot look at the problem as a national problem, as a nation's problem, or as a human problem, 
then I would be pessimistic, but I would be optimistic if um, people's needs rise above the lobbying groups or particular special interest groups and particular tribal politics. And if people's needs could be um, sort of the first and foremost, the high priority they would think of. So I, th I think it's that attitude that's, that's going to solve the problem. I don't think we have a de deficit in expertise on the economic side. Thank you for that answer. And along the same lines, um, so I was thinking about this uh, during one part of your talk. I recently saw an article about a man who had recovered from a lengthy hospitalization due to COVID and received a $1 million hospital bill. And I was reminded of this again because um, someone asked about how the cost of healthcare, um, particularly in the US, but um, hopefully you can compare that a little bit to other places in the world, how the cost of healthcare might be impacting people's ability to recover to their previous levels of financial well being. And, you know, how do we in the US compare to other countries on that? Uh, we, uh... We don't rank very well at all. Uh, we perform very poorly when it comes to the health outcomes, especially when you compare with the dollar figure that we put into the health sector. Um, there have been leaders or politicians who've made this point uh, many times with the data. And so we really have a, a somewhat of a dysfunctional healthcare system. And there are a lot of parts to it but one of the things that happened is that over the last uh, 90 years, um, with, the, with the advent of hospitals and medical technologies that began in the 1920s, and then the Great Depression, and then during World War II era economy when they had to put freezes on prices and wages, which is when the idea of giving healthcare benefit to an employee, that became part of the healthcare system. And then early 1950s, that was um, enshrined into our laws as Congress passed a law that would make that really part of our system. So there are four things happened in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and then early 1950s. Those four things really built up what we now take for granted as our healthcare system. Those four things were not coordinated from 1920s or at any point. They just happened to be the case based on the response to the conditions of a Great Depression, World War, and a legislation in the 50s, and before all of that, just the advent of medical possibilities and technologies. So if we want to fix our problem, we have to go sort of back to the root of our healthcare system, how we have our health insurance system, and also how we have our healthcare provision. And so fixing the healthcare system is a, is a major task but it is something that is definitely doable. We just don't seem to have the political will uh, to regard health as a public good. We instead look at health as a private good. If I can get my health then you know, taken care of, then that's great uh, because I am mainly worried about me and my family. And I'm not, I don't want to really make a sacrifice, you know, dollar wise or uh, tax wise to make sure that other people in the neighborhood might be healthy. What we lose sight of is that when they are healthy, it actually in the long run makes our overall healthcare costs and other things uh, better and our overall social and economic productivity. So I think you would really have to uh, go at it you know, from the root and then healthcare access can become more affordable and uh, more widespread. And again, if you look internationally, you'll see that uh, places like Kerala, had the healthcare access, places like Mumbai, they don't. And in Mumbai and in other parts of India and other parts of the world and in Peru, people are dying. Uh, there's a doctor who was treating COVID-19 uh, patients and then he got COVID-19. And then he was taken to eight or so different hospitals. Every single time the answer was, we do not have a bed. And he died 48 hours after the last hospital visit. And you know, because they don't have the capacity and they don't have the healthcare system, and it, it's just terrible. Um, but there are things that can be done, and there are countries that have provided some uh, reasonable 
models or reasonable approaches that we could consider. Uh, we don't have to become socialistic. Kerala is uh, dominated by a communist party, by the way, but their healthcare system is almost entirely privatized. So they're not, they're communist in, in, in some fashion, but they don't run their province in, a, in what, you, what many people might think as communist. So, um, and I'm not trying to advocate for communist parties or communism, uh, nor will I say that communism is outright bad. Uh, right now, that's not my prerogative to judge one way or the other. But Kerala has amazing success. Um, but it's, you know, they have a good healthcare system, private pu public partnership. I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Rahman, for being here and sharing your expertise with us and especially for reminding us again that, um, that humans are the center of all of this and that's what we need to remember. So I also wanna thank everyone for joining us today and for the excellent questions that were asked and remind you that you can continue these conversations on our Facebook group and another way to continue the conversation is in the Meet the Prof sessions this week. Students who have registered for the course can join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Blackboard Collaborate, and community members can join us at noon on Friday in Blackboard Collaborate. The RSVP links for the Friday sessions will be sent via email, but if you have any questions, please contact COVID course coordinator at owu.edu. We'll see you all again soon.